had to hit the other son in the driveway and want the friend to tie it up and send him home. I know that he passed away. Schools will start up next week. Our teachers. anniversaries. Birthdays. Big one. Big. 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 Big.
this one, but you're not. Because this uh, Karen is volunteered to send them all, Karen. <laughs> This past week, if you weren't able to be here, I hate that for you because you did something that was really exciting. We had our Bible school this past week, and uh, how many people did we have saved? Four. All right, and out of those four, how many of them were members of our church? Zero. What I wanted to do this morning is, first off, I wanted to recognize these two ladies for the efforts and the work that they put in. By the way, uh, I'm looking around, I don't see Miss Betty, but uh, Miss Betty has given each of you one of these flower arrangements. Oh, she's right back here. Well, each of you have these flower arrangements, so uh, either get them now or get them uh, at the end of the service, but we wanted you to have that. But we wanted to also take just a moment and as a church give you thanks. So would you please uh, help me and give a round of applause for these two folks that are in their time. that they 
they, they put in the work and, and the planning to do that, but I know you didn't do it alone. So I'm going to ask, if you were here this past week and you were involved in Bible school, would you please stay? Everybody all threw out? All right. All threw out. Come on, Donnie, you played the, the music. Uh, Chrissy. Give them a hand, because they're the folks that do the work for us to have. You all be seated. But I want to ask you all something, and, and I just want to, I, I just want to uh, let our church know this. What did you do after hearing that God had given us four new souls in salvation? We started rejoicing and crying. We were very And they came up to pray. So before we even start the sermon, before we even read our passage of Scripture, I want you to come down and join with them as we give God thanks for the four new brothers and sisters that we have as Christians. Because sometimes we miss the important parts. You know, we get wrapped up in maybe folks that are not here. We get wrapped up in maybe some of the things that are not going on. We get wrapped up in some of the disappointments in life. But folks, I want you to know the fact that four souls were saved this week is exciting. And we need to give thanks to God for entrusting this place called Child's Memorial to be able to be a, a witness and a tool that God could use to bring those four souls to Jesus. So this morning, if you would, I'm going to ask you, would you please come and join us here at the altar? we get ready to give God thanks and, and praise Him for these souls, I want you to know that I have a confession to make. Because I think that it's the same confession of most people in this room. I didn't believe. You see, I had been so focused on our problems of our church, I didn't think God would bless us with four souls. So as your pastor, I apologize to you for not being a better leader, not having more faith. But the truth is, if I went around and I asked you to be totally honest, I'm afraid that a large number of people in this church would have had the same heart. I say that because God says that's okay. He'll confess it. Let's move on. I will forgive you. I will restore your faith. I will restore our relationship. I'll put you where I need you to be, and we'll go forward. And as we get ready to pray, if you found yourself in the same place that I was in, I want you to know God says, it's okay. I know how the devil is. I know how he's going to attack you. And you just hear God saying, I get it. I know what's happened here. I know what's going on. I know all that's happened around you. But don't forget, I'm still God. And so I'm going to ask you, if you were in the same condition as me, would you just simply, as we pray and give thanks, also just pray and say, God, forgive me for not having faith. I didn't have this passage of Scripture, but I, I, I want to share it with you because God's just laid it on my heart. I feel like I'm one of those disciples in the boat that sees God do the miracle. And I'm worried about all the waves and all the wind and all the rain and everything else around me that I forgot who was guiding the ship. We don't need to forget that God still is in charge. And he controls the destiny of Child's Memorial Baptist Church and the direction which we take. So today, we're going to give him thanks because he's once again proven, oh, ye of little faith, put your trust in me and watch me do things that you never dreamed would be possible. Let's pray together. Brother John, I'm going to ask you to leave us in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to come to you this morning and just truly, Lord, just truly, sincerely from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you, Lord. 
Father, there's been a miracle. And that's four souls, Father, have been claimed to you. That'll never have to face hell, Father. And that separation. And Lord, part, part of the reason why that we were able to do that was because of these ladies right here. I thank you so much for what a blessing it is to have them to be a part of this event. Um, and to allow all the volunteers to come out and to be a part of this. Lord, uh, you've told us time and time again that you are in control, Father, and to just trust in you, Lord. And Father, forgive us because sometimes we take our eyes off of you. We begin to sing, Lord. But I'm thankful that, Father, that there's nothing that we have to do uh, other than trust in you, and you've got the rest. So please forgive us. Help us to be better when we're faced with challenges and opportunities next time. And Lord, we just thank you so much for these souls. And I thank you for every single person that's here today, Lord. Um, we could look around and we could probably name five things that are wrong. But, Father, there's one thing that's great today. We're here and you've left, gave us this chance and opportunity. So help us to uh, focus on the positives. Thank you again for these souls. Forgive us the word we tell you. Bless this time that we have together. In the precious and in the sweet name of your son, Jesus, we thank you and we love you, Lord. Amen. And amen. Thank you for coming out. Jesus 
And he says, Jesus, I have a problem. My daughter, my only daughter, she's 12 years of age. Jesus, I've got a problem. She's dying. And I need you to come with me. I need you to come quickly with me. I need you to come to my house because I believe that if you get there in time and you place your hands upon her, that she will be healed. So Jesus, I'm begging you and I'm pleading with you. Would you please come to my house? And Jesus says, sure, I'm going. Let's go. And so they begin to make this journey to Jairus' house. And lo and behold, all the people are gathered, so much so that they're pressed up against everybody in the, in the way. And so everybody's sort of walking as a group. Everybody's sort of pressed through together. By the way, if, if you've ever been or ever watched the, the ball walk, this is part of what I think about. I'm going to tell you what. The ball walk is, is a passageway where these players from the University of Tennessee walk down and walk in to the stadium as they get ready to go into the game. And there was a time that I went to this stadium to watch these things play out, and I took Addie and Harrison, and we were there, and lo and behold, that press or that, that crowd got together and started, and there was a time where I lost the touch or the grab or the hold of Harrison. I'm going to tell you as a dad what I did. I probably offended every person that was around me because I went to shoving, I went to moving, I went to aggressively getting my way in there to grab hold of my kid and pull him straight back. Why? Because I didn't want anything to happen to him and I knew he was little and I knew the crowd and I knew what could happen and I was hitting to him no matter what, right? That is sort of the crowd that I'm picturing in my mind when, when we're talking about Jesus walking through this crowd. And it's in the midst of this that all this pushing and shoving and all the things that are going on, everybody trying to get Jesus' attention, everybody trying to come up and talk to him, all of a sudden this woman who for night and day kept, uh, had an issue of blood, for night and day she dealt with this problem. Night and day she no doubt was sitting there having to deal with the things in her life. And she reaches out because she believed if I just touch his garment, I'll be healed. And so she reaches out, she touches him, and lo and behold, her faith literally heals her. I want you to pause for a moment. No one else in the crowd has noticed. No one else in the crowd even realizes this woman's on the planet. No one else in the crowd takes pause to look at her and say, hey, this, uh, this woman just got healed. Nobody else, just her. Jesus stops. Imagine, he's walking. Everybody's touching. Everybody's crying out. And all of a sudden, this woman touches in faith. She's healed. And Jesus literally stops and says, You touch me. Now, I want to tell you something. Jesus didn't have to ask that question. Jesus knew who touched him. Jesus didn't have to stop and ask who touched him. It wasn't for him to gain information, it wasn't for him to sit there and look around and say, Who was it? It was his opportunity to give an invitation to this woman to step forward and say, it was me. So Jesus said, who touched me? This morning you may be in this crowd, you may be in this congregation, God may have something planned for you, God may have something that he desires for you to do, and this morning he has entered and given you the invitation saying, I have touched you, now will you come? I have a plan for you, will you be obedient? I have a decision for you to make. Will you accept it? But God is not going to rush you and force you to do anything. God says we're going to say, who touched me? Or in this case, who wants to follow me? Who wants to be uh, obedient to me? Who wants to do and make the decisions that I've asked them to do? And God is going to give you that opportunity today. Just as this lady was given the opportunity to stand up and say, Jesus, I touched you in your spot. And I can what a testimony, right? So in the midst of him getting ready to go to this girl's house, this dying girl of 12 years of age, in the midst of all of that, somebody touches Jesus, and that person gets healed. Jesus still gives the invitation. Jesus still allows her to give the testimony. And sure enough, she begins to proclaim, I touched you, you're fine, I'm healed. And all of a sudden, somebody from the house shows up. Don't bother the master any longer. She died. Can you imagine being Jairus at this moment? Jesus, if you haven't stopped to give this woman time to give her testimony, you might have made it to my house in time to heal her. 
Jesus, why did you stop? What is the big deal about stopping? Jesus, why did you, how did you have to come to a halt to let somebody give a testimony? You already knew. You already had a plan. You already had figured out. You knew this before the beginning of time. And so all of a sudden you stop. Why? Jesus says, oh, don't worry. I'm still coming to the house. And don't worry. I still have a plan. And don't worry. You're going to love my plan. You know, this morning, one of the reasons why I wanted to pause our service to give thanks to God for the poor people that were saved is because we need to sometimes take time to, to stop and say, God, I want you to give a testimony. Thank you for, for, for saving these four souls. Thank you for letting us be a part of that. Thank you for letting us witness that. I wonder how exciting it was. Can I share with you something this morning? I want you to ponder. Your pastor told you this morning that he had lacked faith. And I said, and I quote, no doubt there are others in this church that have lacked faith. Now let me just clarify this for a moment. No one in this room can point a finger at somebody else. Why? Because we all have sin in our lives. All of us are the victims of sin. And all of us fall short of the glory of God. So I can't point my finger and point out your sin and then not in turn have God sit there and remind me of all the sins in my life. It doesn't work that way. Folks, we're all sinners saved by grace. And here's what's crazy about that. And I shared this with someone this morning. Sometimes we as Christians get offended because we're spiritually discerning and we get offended about what someone says that somebody does something. But here's the twist. God says you don't have the right to be offended. Did I say that right? You don't have the right to be offended. You don't have the right to call me out on anything. You don't have the right to point your finger in judgment. Why? Because you too are a sinner. Now I'm going to rehearse that for a moment. Your pastor doesn't have the right to point his finger at you today and call out your sins. I can only sit there and share with you what Jesus said and what the truth is, but I don't have the right to be offended. Sometimes we as Christians get offended. God says, that's not what I asked you to do. What I asked you to do was not be offended, but what I asked you to do was to love your neighbor, to care about your neighbor, to pray for your neighbor, to seek help from your neighbor, to try and help that neighbor rise up and get past their sin so that they might be where they need to be so that God might be able to use them. But nowhere did God ever say, I get the right to be offended. Somewhere along the way, we need to realize that we're victims. I know we sit there and we say, oh no, you got a choice. You don't have to be in sin. You've got the choice. You can do this. You can do that. You've got a choice. But here's the reality. Sometimes we don't realize that we have the right choice, which is to turn to Him. Because you know what? If you live in my power, I don't have any power. Tim, you have the right, or you have the ability, or you can have the choice to not do something. That all sounds good. And man, I want to do that. But the reality is, if I try to do it in my own strength and in my own power, I'm not strong enough. I want to share with you just real quickly about this lady and about Jairus and his dog. Neither one had control of what was going on. Neither one. The lady with the issue of blood did not have power to stop the issue of blood. It said that she had spent her whole life savings trying to get rid of this issue, trying to fix this issue. She had done everything in her power to get it to stop. And there was nothing she could do because she didn't have the power to do it. And in one touch, the touch of Jesus, the power flowed from him to stop the issue of blood. The power flowed from him and gave her the power to stop. Second part of that is, here's this man, Jerry's. His daughter is sick unto death. There's nothing he can do. He can't fix it. He can't change it. Everything is in God's hands. And lo and behold, somebody comes up and tells him, guess what, man? Your daughter died. You need to just let the master go. And at that point in time, Brother Johnny, I don't know about you, I believe I'd have lost a little faith. I think I'd have sat there and been like, oh, man, I was so counting on Jesus to solve my problem. I was so counting on Jesus to fix this problem. 
I was so counting on Jesus to, to heal my daughter, and now she's dead. Put it in terms for our church to understand. You may be sitting here this morning, looking around and saying, where is everybody else at? Why aren't they here? And in your heart, you're saying, God, our church has died. What's there to do? Let me insert Jesus into the question. Jesus said, Jerry, I'm going on to your house. I'm going to show you something. You're going to love it. It's going to be fantastic. Likewise, Jesus this week sat there and told Charles Memorial Baptist Church, just be faithful, just invite those kids, just be there and show up, just have your lessons ready, just get prepared, trust me when I say I'm going to show you something special. And so we do, and Friday night, these kids are sitting here, they're in the audience, they're in the congregation, and lo and behold, God comes on the scene and touches the heart of four young people, and they give their life to Christ. That is God and His power. Waiting on the preacher and His power to do that, I can't do that. If you're thinking that you and your power can do that, you can't do that either. That is God. And what God has said this week is this. Folks, you need to quit worrying about the numbers. You need to quit worrying about the people. You need to quit worrying about the stuff. You just need to be concerned about me. Because when you put your heart the faith of your heart in me, I will tell you what to do. And you'll be just fine. Now, I'm going to ask you, do you think that's going to be easy or hard for our church to do? Huh? You're going to want to do something. You're going to want to change something. You're going to want to make an adjustment somewhere so that things might work out the way that you've got it planned out. But I'm going to tell you something. I was talking to somebody, and somebody asked me how many folks we had, and I said that we averaged about 50 every night. And somebody said, well, we used to average more than that. And I said, you know what? These four kids are part of the huge church. I don't know if there's 100 kids here whether those four kids get saved or not. I don't know if there's 100 other kids here that are making noise and being distractions whether or not those four ever get saved. I don't know that. But I know according to God's plan what happened. I know according to God's plan he had the right number. And I know according to God's plan four kids got set. So why am I trying to do it my way and messing things up when I'll just be trusting him to do it his way? And I have no doubt Jairus in his mind began to question God. Why, why, or Jesus, why did you do these things? Why didn't you do it according to my plan? If you'd have just stuck to my plan, all this would have been fine. If you'd just stuck to my plan... My daughter would have been healed and everything would have been fine. Jesus says to this man, I don't think you really have gotten a hold of what I'm trying to do. You see, I want this person over here, this woman who had an issue of blood, I want her to know I love her. And I've got time for her. Not only do I have time for her, but her testimony is important. And I want the world to hear it. And likewise, God may be telling you this morning, not only are you important, but he's ready for you to share your testimony with the world because your testimony is important. And then go forward, all of a sudden he says, and Jairus, here's why I had to do things the way I had to do them. You see, your daughter, if she's still living, they're just going to assume something else happened that caused her to keep living. Right now, nobody can argue, she died. Die. To show you that I have power over death, she died. And at my word, she's going to arise and live again. And I'm here to tell you this morning that every person in this room is born unto death because we have sinned in our life. And this morning, I want you to grab hold of this thought that we are born again in Christ to a life and life abundant in Him. And it only comes from Jesus Christ because we don't have the power to accept that in our own heart. It has to be, it has to come from God, right? So this morning, I want you to understand something. When those four young people gave their life to Christ, they transferred their heart from a spiritual death to a spiritual life. Johnny, you said it right. It's a you said it right. It wasn't an accident. It was a miracle. It wasn't something that just fell into our lives. It was a plan that was destined 
by God. And that's one of the reasons we came down front and we prayed tonight or this morning was to acknowledge that God, not only did you have the power, you had the plan, and we're thankful. Going forward, we have to also show the faith that says, God, we don't really know where we're going or what we're doing, but we put our trust in you because you are able, because you have the power. I'm going to wrap up with this real quick. As you heard this story play out, as you think about Jerry's for just a moment, do you feel like Jerry feels like Jesus came through for him? Do you feel like Jarius, at the end of the story, feels like, man, I'm just kidding to the dead. Jesus is Jesus because his plan is perfect. Man, I'm just kidding to the dead that I let Jesus do it his way because if I'd done it my way, it would have turned out near as sweet as the way Jesus has done it. I'm so thankful that Jesus was in control, that it was Jesus' plan, and that everything turned out just the way it should. This morning, we need to be like Jerry. We need to look back on this past week and say, God, I'm so thankful that you were in control. I'm so thankful that you let your plan unfold. I'm so glad that I wasn't the obstacle in your plan. I'm so glad that I didn't try and take control of your plan. I'm so glad that I just allowed things to play out as you had them to play out because, God, I know right now I have new, I have four new brothers and sisters in Christ. Your plan. For me. As we go forward, and as we continue to take the next step, and as we look down the road, we need to continue to trust Jesus to help us with the plan. In fact, we need to exercise faith that says, Jesus, I believe you've got the best plan. God, while I may have my mind going a million miles an hour in a million different ways, God, I just want you to very clearly and very precisely pierce my heart and tell me what do I need to do to be a part of the plan. With that being said, I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and with your eyes closed. Brother David makes his way back to the front. He's going to sing a song in just a second. But with heads bowed and with eyes closed, I want you to just ask yourself this question. What is it that God wants me to do this morning? What is it that's been placed on my heart to do this morning to be a part of His plan? I'm not asking you to, to change the whole world. I'm not asking you to, to make, uh, make uh, decisions for other people. I'm just simply asking you to ask God, God, what do I need to do? And then I'm asking you to be obedient and do whatever God tells you to do do that this morning. I'm going to pray for you this morning. God, I pray that you might just open heaven's gates and Father, that you just might pour down your spirit today. And God, that our hearts might just be attentive and, and Father, that our souls might just be excited about all that you're doing because God, we know when we obey your plan great things happen. So God, this morning, we're turning everything over to you. We're being totally obedient to you. When you call upon us to go, we'll go. When you call upon us to share, we'll share. When you call upon us to pray, we'll pray. But God, we're going to be totally obedient to you because we know that that's the way that we have to be in order for your plan to work. So God, we give you thanks for having a plan ready. We give you thanks for letting us be involved. Bless us now. Bless that one that's lost this morning that they might come and receive Christ as their Savior, that they too might know what it means to surrender a heart to Jesus and that they might be made whole. Bless us now, for it's in your name we pray. And with heads bowed and with eyes closed, as Brother David sings, if God's to you, you come right now.
I'm so glad you're here this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Eric to dismiss us with prayer. Before he does, let me remind you, ladies, that there's going to be a meeting this Friday at what time? 530. 530 in uh, Sundown Fellowship Building uh, to have discussions about when will be the appropriate time to start back up when the top of study and, and setting a date and time to, to start that. But you all be much in prayer this week. Be excited about what God's doing. I promise you, God has a plan. We need to trust. Brother Eric. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for preaching your word, Lord. We give thanks for those four that accept you this week at Bible, Bible School, Lord. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for the message. We pray that we'll keep our eyes on you and focus on the Lord. Bring us back to the next appointed time. For us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Connie. Get you one of the bouquets up there. Okay. <laughs> They were supposed to be presented, but I'm not sure this time is correct from what I've got. I'll straighten it out and let you know. Okay. Yeah, Paul can't be done this morning. Yeah, okay. Do you need any back pictures on it? Well, I can, and then... You can send it to me. Oh, I've got to turn this off.